we we go now for the second part. The second part uh, we call the first uh, detailed analysis of uh, uh, thermal networks, then uh, gas networks, uh, and then we will sort of have a concluding discussion with Keith uh, and all uh, uh, and all the speakers. Uh, now in next uh, next hour or so there will be Elisa Welpa and Vittorio Verda from Protectorate Torino in Italy, uh, the well recognized expert in uh, uh, heat network modeling, as, as you will see. And uh, the idea is now we will go uh, into sort of very deep details of this kind of analysis, uh, uh, focusing particularly on uh, uh, specific uh, uh, energy vectors that are different uh, from electricity, in this case, heat. Uh, and I will see later uh, gas also with uh, uh, Misha Cherkov. Uh, so uh, Elisa, Elisa, please, as, as we discussed, uh, it would be good uh, if you could present for about 20, 25 minutes and then same for Vittorio. And uh, we could keep it overall within 45 minutes would be great. It's all yours now, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm Elisa Guelpa from Politecnico di Torino and uh, I'm going to show you the first part of this presentation that is related to the thermal network. So uh, I'm going to discuss generally about the uh, thermal network. So what is a thermal network? And then why modeling thermal networks? So let's start from the, the first uh, question. So what is a thermal network that is also called this reheating network? It is a network that is used to supply heat to buildings in urban areas. So there are one or more thermal plants that produce heat in form of mainly hot water. Hot water is sent to the various buildings through some pipelines that are installed in the ground. So the pipelines co constitute the network. Then the, the water is sent to the, the substations that are installed in the building. A substation is mainly a heat exchanger, so a device that is used to, uh, to exchange heat from the network, so the district heating network, and the heating circuit of the building. And in the end, the heating uh, circuit of the building is used to heat the heating devices, so mainly radiators, in order to uh, increase temperature of the indoor environment, so of buildings. The same can be seen in a map. Here we can see a map of a district heating system. We can see the thermal plant, in this case just one, in red. In blue, we can see the pipelines that are installed in the ground that connect the thermal plants to the various buildings. And then in, uh, in black, the various buildings where the substations are installed. Why does it make sense using a district heating network uh, behavior model, so a thermal network model? Well, it makes sense because it allows us to understand which are the effects of modification on a thermal network. So which are the benefits that we can achieve by modifying in some way the thermal network. And this can be done uh, in, in two main ways. The first, studying the heating network, so the thermal network, uh, as a standalone system. And then it can be done uh, considering the thermal network included in a multi-energy uh, framework. So considering also gas and electricity network. Um, so in a, in a more complex uh, context. For instance, as said Professor Mar Martinez uh, this morning, uh, an interesting option is uh, considering the, the thermal network as a, as a way to store energy. So uh, we can try to consider an, electrical, an electricity network that is mainly fed, supplied by um, renewable energy sources. In this case, it's probable that uh, installing electricity uh, storage can be 
only electricity storage is uh, a bit uh, um, expensive, so the cost is very high. So an interesting option is to consider the thermal network uh, as a sink in order to store energy. So the network and also the thermal storage that are installed in the thermal network. So in, in this context, it makes sense to understand which is the behavior of the network relying on proper uh, thermal network models. Uh, a main reason for um, modeling this reheating network is because the, the various networks that uh, are, are built uh, all over the world are very different among them. Since they differ for the sites and the topologies, because uh, there are very large networks, but also very small networks, they can be uh, looped or tree shaped. They can be um, used in um, places where with a high energy density or a low energy density. So the demand is very concentrated or is more distributed. But also they can differ for the source that is used. That can be, I don't know, uh, combined heat and, um, and power production plants uh, or solar plants or geothermal and so on. They also differ for the, the supply temperature that can be from 60 degrees for the low temperature networks to 150 degrees for the high temperature networks. They can differ for, for the demand profiles since uh, it depends uh, in the location of the net, in, in, yes, in the place where the, the, the network is located since, for instance, uh, in case of uh, harsh climate, uh, the thermal demand is clearly much different than in case of mild climate. And then uh, because of the operation mode. Here we can see some example of existing district heating networks. Uh, here in this slide, we can see the um, district heating network of Rotten in Sweden. It is a, a small size network, about 180 buildings connected, and it is uh, long, is three kilometers uh, long. So it is quite small, and it is uh, um, supplied by biomass. So it is just one, um, one uh, thermal plant that supplies all the, the entire system. Here we have another example that is a network in Ferrara in Italy that is a medium sized network. It uh, includes uh, about 600 buildings with a network that is 80 kilometers long. And in this case, the network is supplied by the geothermal source. So it's clear comparing this uh, network with the previous one that there are various differences. The first is the topologies. We can see that in this case, the main generation plan is, uh, is far from the city, while in case, uh, um, in the previous case, uh, the, the generation plan was in the middle of the network. Then in this case, we have a medium sized network, uh, while in the other cases, it was a small size. The, the source is geothermal, not biomass. And also the place, it's very different. The climate is very different. It's once in, once in, is in Italy and the other one is in Sweden. So it's expected a different thermal uh, demand. Also the profile is different because in Italy, uh, that is, uh, it's uh, quite uh, warm. The climate, it's expected. Uh, that uh, the heating system are switched off during the night. So the, the various heating systems switched on during the morning create a very high thermal peak in the morning. While in the north of Europe, usually the, the, the heating system are never switched off in winter. 
So there are, there are these are um, some differences of uh, the these two this reheating that I just presented. Here we can see a larger size network. It is the network in Vienna, in Austria. Now we can see in the map that it is characterized by two main parts. The first is the main network that is in red. It is characterized by the largest, uh, by the pipeline with largest diameter that are used to connect uh, the various thermal plants uh, to the various areas of the city. And in blue, we can see the uh, distribution networks that are used to connect the main network to the various buildings. And in this case, the uh, diameter are smaller. In this case, the, um, the network is uh, fed by waste heat. So it produced uh, using the waste of the city. And in the end, we see the last example, that is the, two, the um, district heating network in Turin, in Italy. It is uh, the, the one that we mostly analyze in our work, since uh, we are from Turin. And uh, in this case, the network is also a large size network, since it, it connects 6,500 buildings with a network that is 800 kilometers long. It is mainly supplied by uh, combined heat and power production plants, but for the base load. While the peaks are covered by using heat only boilers, so heaters that are just used to produce heat, and, um, and also water tank storage. In this case, also, we can see the, the main network that is in red and the distribution networks in blue that connects the, the main network to the various buildings. So what are the, the main, some of the main issues in thermal network? Uh, because the, the use of thermal network model is important. We can see some of them. The first, the first one of them is related to pumping. Since it is important to uh, transport, it is important, it is necessary to, to transport water from the thermal plants to the various parts of the cities. And this is done to win friction and the differences in altitude. And the, the water transportation is done by using a pumping system. Some pumps are installed at the thermal plants and some pumps are installed along the network, along the pipelines. Why it is important to reduce the energy is consumed in the pumping? Because um, in case of uh, uh, the afternoon demand in cold days, for instance, the, um, the thermal demand is about uh, 1000 megawatts and the pumping demand is five electrical megawatts. This means that considering the primary energy consumption, we have that pumping covers about 2.5% of the network requirements. So in, in this context, it's important to reduce uh, the uh, energy spent for pumping. And this can be done only relying on a proper thermal network model. So the analysis that, uh, that we perform uh, showed that uh, the cost reduction in terms, of, in terms of energy that can be achieved is about the 20% at the, about 20% at the thermal load larger than 50%. So the reduction is, is quite significant. A second interesting topic is related to the failure management. 
In this image, you can see this is not a swimming pool, but it's, this is actually a, a square of a city in the north of Europe after a pipeline breakup. And considering the failure probability in this reheating network, it is an event, in general, a failure event occurs uh, one time per year in large, uh, large um, scale network. It, it's not just pipeline breakup. There are also leakages, there are also um, pump failure and problems in, uh, in the plants. But it is important to consider the, present of, the presence of failures event. In this case, we consider the problem of breakup. And when a breakup occur, or, or also leakage, the, the problem actually is similar for leakages, um, what happens is that the pipeline is insulated. So the two valves upstream and downstream, the pipeline are both closed. And so the, this pipeline is like, if not exist anymore. So it, it's like a change in the topology of the network. And in this condition, it is necessary to provide as much heat as possible to the buildings with a different network topology. So what can be done is to um, operate uh, the pumps uh, and the thermal network in, in order to provide as much as, as possible to the, the buildings. And uh, in, in a work that, uh, that we performed uh, uh, in the past, we proved that considering six failure cases, so six breakup that uh, occur in different area of the network, for five out of six cases, it is possible relying on a network model it is possible to provide the correct amount of heat to the user despite the, the malfunction. Well, in, in, the, in the last case, the, the mass flow is reduced to about 75%. And the, also an important application is demand side management. You, you know for sure better than me what is demand side management in electricity network. And this is done by modifying the electricity demand in order to achieve a, an overall electricity demand that is more similar to the, like the, the, the pro, what is more similar to the production. So what, what we'd like to have as, uh, as, thermal, as electricity demand. And the same can be done for the heating network. So it is possible to modify the thermal request at the building level in order to achieve a, an optimal heating demand, an overall heating demand. So in this case, for instance, what we did is to anticipate the switching on time of the heating systems in buildings in order to optimally shave the thermal peak at the plant level. So find the best set of, of anticipation in order to minimize the peak request. And this can be done just relying on a, a thermal network model, since it is important to study the dynamics because the the overall demand at the plant level is not just the sum of the heating demand at building level because of the phenomena that occurs in the thermal network. And in this case, the results that we achieve is a reduction of the peak of about 27% uh, and a reduction of the CO2 emission of uh, 
because uh, the ketone boilers that are less efficient um, than uh, CHP plant are used for a lower fraction, lower time fraction. So you can see that the, in this case, the peak is almost completely shaved. And then the last application is related to power to cool. So in this case, we can see it's not a, a hot network, so it's not a district heating network, but this is a district cooling network that is actually the same of this reheating, but the water that is transporting the pipeline is not hot, but it's cold. And this is used in the summer. So this case show how the thermal networks can be used uh, in a multi-energy network framework. So in this case, uh, the model can be used in order to optimally locate the position of power to cool um, system in order to produ produce cold using electricity. So in this case, is, uh, the, the question is where to install the power to cool groups in order to minimize the costs related to uh, network design. So the the diameters of the pipeline installed. So, and uh, so both the, the network design, yes, the net network design and the pumping cost during the network operation. So the goal is to minimize both this cost and the, the optimal installation, the optimal location of the power to cool groups allows to, uh, to reduce of 7% the costs for pumping and installation respect to, case, to a case of uniformly distributed power to cool groups. Okay, this is just an overview of all the, the application that I showed you. So, which are the, the goal that you can achieve by using uh, thermal network models. I also added two, um, two technology, yes, two applications that I do not have time to discuss now, that is the increase of the number of buildings connected without adding additional pipeline, and also the effects of storage installation. Okay, so, I think that in the in this first part, uh, okay, we clarified what what is a thermal network and why it is important to rely on thermal network model. And then I leave the floor uh, to my colleague uh, Vittorio Verda that is going to talk about the to, to detail the thermal network models. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can, uh, you can see my screen. So, uh, so basically in this second part, uh, I'll discuss a little bit uh, uh, the insights related with the modeling thermal networks. Uh, First of all, let me uh, start with the problem statement. Uh, so why uh, do we need to model the network? Uh, my colleague Elisa uh, already discussed uh, some possible applications, but uh, from the uh, physical viewpoints, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, focus what happens uh, during operation of these three heating systems. Uh, so we have uh, various buildings connected with the, with the network. Uh, each building is characterized by uh, its own demand profile, uh, which is time dependent. Uh, as you can see here, there are two examples of typical uh, Mediterranean uh, systems with uh, the heating system, uh, which is stopped 
at night, while uh, if we consider uh, northern countries, typically the district heating uh, also operate at night, uh, even if uh, at a small load. Uh, so we have these uh, uh, with these profiles, which differ in terms of uh, uh, shape, uh, and also the time the heating system is switched on uh, might be uh, significantly different from uh, a building to another one. Uh, then all these, uh, uh, let's say, thermal disturbances travel the network, uh, and the network uh, modify. Uh, the let's say the summation of all these uh, curves we have at each building, and these uh, changes are due to the losses, but also uh, to the uh, way the uh, heat mainly propagates in the network, uh, which uh, what the mechanism is uh, the advection mechanism. So the velocity. Uh, the velocity uh, of propagation of heat in the network is mainly uh, the fluid velocity. So because of this, uh, of the different distances uh, between the uh, buildings and the plants, uh, the various curves uh, basically modify and we come up with a, a profile at the thermal plants, which is uh, significantly different than uh, the summation we would have time to time uh, of all the, uh, the thermal load profiles at the buildings. And we would like to understand uh, what is the effect of uh, what we can do at the buildings or at the network on the thermal plants. Uh, if we want to do that, if we want to uh, consider the, uh, the effect of network, we basically need to consider uh, the following items. First of all, uh, we should be able to represent the network topology. Uh, then we need a, a way to model the fluid dynamic behavior, so the, how the mass flow rates distribute uh, in the network, and that's particularly uh, important in the case uh, uh, the network presents loop, which is uh, uh, generally the case when considering uh, large networks, but also in the case of small networks, uh, we might have loops. And finally, uh, we need to consider the thermal model. So we uh, would like to calculate uh, uh, the temperature distributions uh, moving from uh, the plant to the buildings and back from the buildings uh, to the plants. First, the network topology. Typically, uh, in networks, we consider one dimensional representation. So each component, uh, you may consider a portion of pipeline as the typical component, uh, is represented as shown there. Uh, and this representation rely on uh, uh, two concepts. The first one is uh, the node. Uh, you see uh, the, two, uh, the two circles uh, numbered with one and two in the figure. These are nodes. Uh, and these are cross sections in, uh, in, the, in the pipes uh, in which you may have uh, the link between uh, one portion of pipe and at least another one or more than uh, another, uh, another pipe. So this might be uh, junctions between uh, two or more uh, portion of pipes. Nodes are uh, always numbered in uh, the network representation. And we typically use this uh, concept in order to uh, represent uh, pressures and temperature values. Also, the second concept is the branch. Uh, this is a, 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 an element uh, which is bounded by, always bounded by two nodes. Uh, we identify a conventional direction uh, in the pipe, which means that uh, we consider, in this case, the node one being the inlet node and the node two being the outlet node. 
but that that's just conventional meaning that uh, uh, during calculation if we obtain positive mass flow rates means that one is really the inlet and to the outlet while if we consider if we obtain uh, negative mass flow rates uh, it means that the real flow is opposite with respect to the conventional one uh, so branches are also numbered and uh, in branches, we typically calculate uh, uh, mass flow rates. Uh, then we also have some uh, uh, post processing uh, quantities. The topology uh, is obtained considering the, uh, the incidence matrix, which is a, a well known uh, concept uh, uh, which, is, which is derived from graph theory. Uh, the incidence matrix is characterized by a number of rows equal to the number of nodes and a number of columns equal to the number of, uh, of branches. And the general term is one uh, if the height uh, row, uh, if the height uh, um, node is the inlet node of the jth uh, branch is minus one if it's the outlet and it's zero otherwise. So here you have an example. In this particular case, we have uh, six nodes and six branches. But for instance, if we would like to add an, an additional branch uh, between uh, uh, node four and node uh, uh, three, uh, we just add a, a column uh, with the information related with the additional uh, element we have considered. That's particularly uh, important since the uh, incidence matrix is used in order to represent the network topology and to compute it. Then we uh, should consider the fluid dynamic uh, problem. Uh, this problem uh, is properly uh, set when considering two types of equation. One is the mass balance and the mass balance is um, obtained at the nodes uh, and the momentum balance uh, which is typically considered consider, uh, obtained considering the branch as the as the control volume uh, just to uh, to clarify a little bit in the mass balance we consider all the flow rates entering and exiting the node plus a possible flow rate uh, uh, this is the second term on the on the left hand side of the equation, the first equation, uh, which is an extraction uh, at the node. And this term, uh, this second term, is just is typically used when uh, uh, representing the network as an open network in order to account for uh, overall uh, inlet and overall outlet flows. While the momentum balance. Uh, basically expresses uh, the difference between the outlet pressure and the inlet pressure of a branch. That's a total pressure, so it means uh, that it's the static pressure plus the kinetic plus the potential. Uh, while on the right-hand side of the equation, we have the pressure differences due to uh, friction, uh, distributed friction or local friction, or the effects due, due to possible pumps installed uh, in the branches. Uh, the second equation, uh, the second version uh, of the momentum uh, of the momentum balance uh, is just obtained from the first one, uh, but expressing the friction terms, the, fr the two terms we have on the uh, right hand side of this equation uh, as the function of the mass flow rate. That's particularly important since this equation uh, relates the two uh, independent variables uh, in, the, in the system we have. Uh, the independent variables in the fluid dynamic problem are pressures and mass flow rates. You see that the mass balance only accounts for uh, uh, this second variable, the mass flow rates while in the momentum balance, we have a link between pressure and, uh, uh, and flow rates. And it's a nonlinear link. Uh, if we consider the, uh, again, the mass balance 
at a single node, we can uh, obtain in a matrix form uh, the balance for all the nodes in the network. You see that this mass balance uh, rely on the incidence matrix, which is the capital A uh, we have in this second equation. Uh, so it's very important to uh, here to consider the, uh, the proper uh, topology. Uh, and then we have the uh, two vectors containing the uh, mass flow rates in the branches and the extraction, the mass uh, flow rates extracted at the nodes. Uh, the first vector, uh, the capital G, is the vector of the unknowns, while the second term, uh, the GX, is the vector where we put, where we assign uh, the boundary conditions. So that's vector of known terms. Concerning the uh, fluid dynamic problem, again, if we consider the, uh, the, the, the equation for a single branch, uh, we can introduce uh, a quantity, which is a, an hydraulic resistance of a, of a pipe, uh, and you see that we have basically incorporated all constants there plus a term uh, dependent on the mass flow rate. So it means that we can rewrite the momentum equation as the pressure at the inlet minus pressure at the outlet equal to the hydraulic resistance, uh, the capital R. But remember that in the capital R, we have a dependence, a linear dependence on the mass flow rate, again, times the mass flow rate. And the last term is the pressure rise due to the pumps. Also, this equation can be expressed in, uh, in matrix form, uh, as shown there. Uh, you see that uh, we have the, uh, the, the, mat the incidence matrix, the vector of the pressures in the nodes on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have a matrix of the hydraulic resistances times the vector of mass flow rates. And the last term is the vector associated with the pressure rise due to pumps. Uh, we can uh, uh, rearrange uh, a little bit this, uh, this term, uh, this equation, in order to express the mass flow rate as the function of the pressures. Mm -hmm. That's the form we typically use in order to solve the, uh, the fluid dynamic problem. But again, here I'm stressing uh, the fact that uh, uh, in the uh, terms indicated as capital R, uh, there is a dependence on the mass flow rate. Okay, so we need a strategy uh, to solve this uh, fluid dynamic problem. A quite well-known strategy to, uh, to solve it, uh, to solve this fluid dynamic problem is also used uh, uh, in order to solve uh, the same equation at continuum level. Uh, so also in uh, CFD codes, for instance, uh, is the small simple algorithm which was proposed by Patankar and Spalding in the 70s. That's a, a, a robust algorithm and also presents uh, advantages while imposing the boundary condition. Uh, the idea is basically the following one. Pressures and uh, in mass flow rates are expressed as the summation of, the summation of two terms a guess value, the star term, uh, plus the uh, correction, uh, and that's the prime term uh, for pressures and, and mass flow rates. In order to understand a little bit how this uh, method works, uh, we should consider basically uh, two steps uh, to, um, to identify the first, uh, the first uh, uh, way we handle uh, the, the, the approach, uh, considering the, uh, the continuity, I'm sorry, the momentum equation uh, expressed for all the branches, we can obtain a, an expression, which is the last one, uh, relating the correction on the mass flow rates with the correction 
on the pressures. So once we have the correction on the pressures, we are able to obtain the corrections on the, on the mass flow rates. Uh, the correction, the corrections on the pressures are obtained considering instead uh, the, um, the mass conservation equation expressed for all nodes. So you see that uh, uh, we obtain a linear system uh, and solving this linear system, we come up with the, the corrections. The problem is that due to the uh, fact that uh, the hydraulic resistance depends on the mass flow rate, we need an iterative solution for the, uh, for the entire system. Uh, so we can uh, more or less uh, represent the full uh, algorithm in this way. We start from gas values of pressures and mass flow rates. We solve the momentum equation for these gas uh, values. We calculate the corrections. We correct the, the, uh, the initial gases and we iterate until convergence is uh, reached. Uh, still, there is some issue related with the fact that uh, the momentum equation for the gas values is nonlinear. And uh, we, we need uh, also an algorithm in order to solve this nonlinear system. Uh, and typically, a fixed point algorithm might be uh, effectively used in order to uh, take to, to, to obtain the, the, this solution. Concerning the thermal problem, which is the, uh, the, last, uh, the last step we, we, we need to consider, uh, well, these are, this is uh, uh, solved considering the energy equation uh, applied to the uh, control volume, which is represented uh, in the figure. Basically, uh, it includes a node plus half length branch uh, for all branches entering and exiting that node. So we basically can write a number of equations of energy equations equal to the number of nodes. And actually our unknowns are the temperature in the nodes. Uh, just to clarify a little bit this equation, uh, there are five terms. The first one is the time rate of change of energy. So the term uh, we need to consider uh, in the case we are solving a transient process. The second term on the uh, left hand side accounts for the advective terms. So the energy which is transported by the mass flow rates. Uh, then the term we have the first term on the right hand side is the uh, term related with heat conduction and that this term is generally uh, negligible usually it's negligible and then we have a source and sink terms uh, the source term is uh, typically related with uh, uh, heat generation uh, in the network this might be for instance due to uh, for instance heat pumps which might be installed or also the pumps uh, also contribute. While the last term, the loss, uh, the, the, the sink term, uh, represents the thermal losses uh, of the pipelines. The easier, uh, the easiest uh, approach uh, that might be used in order to solve the, uh, the thermal problem uh, is uh, the upwind uh, the upwind method, the upwind scheme. Why do we need this scheme? Uh, well, basically, uh, if, let me go back to the previous slide. Uh, you see that uh, at the boundaries of this control volume, uh, where it's written T1, T2, T3, etc. Well, these boundaries, these points, are uh, located. Uh, in the middle point of each branch. Uh, these points, these temperatures uh, are not obtained uh, while solving the, uh, while solving the uh, energy equation. We only obtain uh, uh, 
temperatures in the nodes. So we need to relate a, form, a way to relate uh, the temperatures in the nodes with the temperatures at half branch. And the upwind scheme is a, is a possible method to, to do it. Uh, the idea in this case is that we consider the temperature at half branch equal to the temperature we have in the upstream node. Hmm? This uh, assumption is, uh, uh, well, very popular uh, since makes the, uh, the algorithm very stable while solving the, uh, while solving the problem, uh, but uh, uh, it might, might create uh, numerical issues. Let me just uh, spend a few words about it. Uh, if we consider the energy equation in a very simple form with just uh, uh, the pure advective term, so just uh, the second term, let me go back to the, to the equation, just the second term we have on the, uh, on the left hand side, Okay, without the transients, without the heat conduction, without the heat generation of sinks. Uh, and if we develop this term using the upwind approximation, uh, basically we have an approximation error, uh, which is second order. So it's uh, an approximation error, uh, which behave uh, in the same way as diffusion as conduction. And you also see that uh, uh, the error uh, linearly scale with uh, uh, the grid size, this delta x we have uh, on the denominator of the red box. Okay, so means that uh, uh, the, uh, the idea uh, is to consider uh, sufficiently small lengths in order to allow a better approximation of the of the uh, temperature uh, evolutions if we compute uh, this equation for a, a for an example of pipe with a non-dimensional length equal to one uh, and we compare the exact solution, which is the green one, uh, with the numerical solution, you see that depending on the number of nodes we are using, uh, the approximation uh, is quite bad if the number of nodes is, is uh, very small. And you see that the behavior uh, looks like a diffusive um, well, accounts for a diffusive term, and that's the numerical diffusion. It's just a numerical uh, effect. While uh, if we are able to increase uh, the number of nodes, uh, we are able to approximate better and better the exact solution. Uh, uh, Vittorio, sorry to interrupt you, just to check uh, how long you still uh, have to go. Well, just a few minutes. Just yeah, uh, it's uh, it's already yeah it, because it, it is yeah, yeah just, uh, let, just a couple of minutes, minutes. Yeah, yes great. two three minutes um, I'm yeah. okay. uh, well just to tell you that uh, in the case this uh, issue uh, is crucial uh, there are possible alternatives uh, one alternative is the so-called method of characteristics. Uh, which is quite popular in, uh, uh, in district heating modeling. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, also some issues uh, while uh, dealing with mixing flows and uh, uh, computation of thermal losses. So these are not straightforward. And there is another, uh, another approach, which is uh, the so-called plug flow, uh, which is a Lagrangian approach. Uh, this might also be uh, very useful when, uh, especially when uh, uh, transient terms are uh, are important. So when the operation is uh, is is very transient. 
Here are just uh, a few slides uh, related with validation. So uh, we uh, typically validate uh, our uh, models with the uh, real data, data that are available from uh, the substations. Uh, so are the buildings or uh, data which are available at the plants. Mm. So here, just to show you that uh, uh, these approaches for modeling might be sufficiently accurate to represent the district heating behavior. Uh, and these are the, the conclusion. Uh, modeling is, of course, crucial, as uh, Lisa uh, discussed in the, in the first part of the, of the presentation. Uh, in the case of district heating uh, systems, you need to capture uh, both the free dynamic and the thermal behavior. The free dynamic is a potential issue when uh, uh, we have to consider loop networks and when uh, uh, there are multiple buster pumps installed in the, in the network, along the network. While the thermal model is particularly um, uh, important and particularly also, uh, well, a, a possible issue, uh, when the, uh, the behavior is typically transient. Uh, and that's the case uh, when going uh, to some particular networks, which are modeled, uh, which are, I'm sorry, uh, operated varying the uh, supply temperature, while in, uh, uh, in, many, uh, in many cases, the uh, supply temperature is, uh, uh, is constant during operation. But there are many networks instead where this variable is, uh, is modified. But it's particularly crucial when going towards next generation district heating. Uh, we are now talking about uh, uh, fourth generation and even fifth generation district heating. Well, in this case, when uh, uh, temperatures are going lower and lower, uh, transient uh, might be a very, uh, very important and crucial, and so must be uh, properly modeled. That's a list of possible publication you may look at, and that's the end of my, uh, my presentation, and I thank you all very much. Thank you, Vittorio, that's great. Thanks, uh, thanks Elise, also. Uh, I, I would like to ask you a, a, a question uh, straight away. Uh, I think uh, you you saw the um, uh, Alex presentation this morning. I think one of the one of the issues in, in kind of uh, modeling these integrated energy systems is understanding, uh, as we mentioned a couple of times, uh, uh, the uh, the intertemporal constraint issue, and uh, uh, looking at uh, the thermal networks, uh, for example, the abilities of these networks to operate uh, as uh, some form of virtual uh, storage. So this basically means that you need to use uh, 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 dynamic equations as opposed to a sort of steady state equations. Do you have a feeling as to uh, under what uh, conditions actually you may be able still uh, with some steady state equation, although approximated, be able to capture in, in good ways uh, uh, the dynamics of thermal networks. So is, is there, for example, for smaller networks, some very simple way of capture the, 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 the water content and, and the thermal storage available in the network? Do you have a feeling or, or some sort of rule of thumb or something very basic? We, we yeah, might well, that. yeah, I think you can uh, more or less uh, uh, compare the characteristic time for uh, uh, the network with the uh, observing type time of the uh, of the storage you are applying. Uh, let's say the characteristic time depends on the water velocity in the network, and of course the network length. So if you are considering, uh, let's say, a network uh, 100 meter long, and the water is typically uh, flowing at let's say one and one meter per second, more or less. Uh, so means that uh, uh, you need uh, 100 seconds uh, in order to uh, to reach uh, from the plant the buildings and another 100 seconds uh, from the uh, buildings back to the uh, to the plant. 
So if your uh, observing time is larger than uh, uh, this time, uh, basically you can uh, you can consider the the steady state version. All right, that, 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 that that's that's great. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Just like like fasting here, great. I think Keith has got has got a question also for you. Keith, please. Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm just interested in how the design and operation of a heat network changes when you change the heat source. So I think the examples that uh, Elisa showed, there was one was, uh, I think, uh, using heat from burning waste. I think another one was biomass. I think the third one was a geothermal source. But I'm wondering particularly about uh, sort of large scale heat pumps, let's say air source heat pumps. Uh, does, you know, what, what, what are the kind of choices in terms of the, the, the power rating of the heat pump or the operating temperature of the heat network? And what kinds of things would you need to consider in, in trying to get the design right of this integrated system? But in, in case, uh, actually the, the selection in, in, the, in case of uh, use of heat pumps, the selection of the supply temperatures is quite important since uh, uh, actually, I don't know which is the maximum temperature that uh, it's possible to, to produce with heat pumps, but I don't think that uh, over uh, 100 degrees it's possible. So in this case, it's, it's particularly important to keep the, temp the supply temperature low. Uh, in case of uh, actual CHP plant, you can also have higher temperature and uh, in case of biomass, the, the same, and also waste heat uh, and thermal plants, you can also select higher temperature. The point is that uh, lower is the temperature of, uh, of the water that you supply and uh, uh, lower is uh, for, for Instance in in case of CHP, if the, it's lower the temperature of the heat that you produce, and uh, matches the um, the electricity that you, it's like you, you can produce contemporary using heat. So it, it's uh, it's more convenient, it's more efficient the system if you produce a low temperature uh, heat clearly. So in in some cases is mandar mandatory, like in case of heat pumps. In some cases, it's more convenient to uh, use low temperature supply. I don't know if this, this is the, the, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, and, and not, but, I mean, I, I suppose a disadvantage of having a lower temperature is you simply can't get as much heat through the system or you can't get it through as quickly. So I guess, I guess there's got to be a sort of a compromise somewhere in terms of, you know, the kind of practical yeah. operating temperature and I wonder whether that compromise also is made more difficult when actually you've got multiple heat sources in the same heat network. Yeah, yes and also a very complicated thing is that in usually large heat these heating systems are already existing and so you cannot just change the the supply temper because you change the supply the, the kind of supply because the pipeline and the heating uh, and the heat exchangers are already built and these are designed for uh, a certain kind of supply temperature. And therefore, uh, you, you, there, there are, it's quite complicated to uh, uh, change the supply temperature after the network has been uh, built. It can be done, but it's, uh, it's quite complicated. So the, the point is also is if the network is already existing or it is new. Yeah, right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank, th thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you again, Victoria. I think uh, we will stop here for, for at least for, for, for this session. So let's have now 15, about 15 minutes break, and then we'll start again with Misha's presentation about uh, gas networks, so the, like, like yours, but for gas networks. Uh, and then we have a chance to ask uh, and, and answer actually more questions in the very final session. So let's, uh, let's resume in about 15 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you.